Welcome everyone to the Equal Opportunities Committee. It's the 13th meeting of 2014. Can I ask you to set any electronic devices to flight mode or switch off, please? Today's third agenda item is the delegation of the payment of witness expenses on the youth homelessness inquiry. And members are invited to delegate to me as convener responsibility for arranging for the SPCB to pay under Rule 12.4.3 any expenses of witnesses in our scrutiny of the inquiry. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you, we're all agreed. We now move on to our final agenda item, which is an evidence session on our youth homelessness inquiry. We start the session off with some introductions. And at the table, we have our clerking and research team, official reporters and broadcasting services. And around the room, we are supported by the security office and welcome also to the observers in the public gallery. My name is Margaret McCulloch and I'm the committee's convener. And I'm now going to invite members and witnesses to introduce themselves in turn, starting on my right. Can I also ask the young people here to tell us a bit about their experiences of homelessness Matthew, where are you? It's Matthew, mate, excellent. Matthew, you've been here before, so can I ask you to talk briefly about your experience since the previous committee inquiry? So what's happened to you since then up to just okay. now? Yeah, well, I first... What can we... Just go out. It's OK when we come to you, thanks. Uh, and can I also ask representatives from the Highland Homeless Trust and Who Cares Scotland and my people to tell us briefly about their organisations? And can I now ask John Mason to start the introductions? Uh, right, my name is John Mason. I'm the MSP for Glasgow Shettleston, which is part of the East End of Glasgow. I'm Ryan Oman. I'm here for the Homeless Trust. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Dr. Paul Mullen from the Highland Homeless Trust. Uh, Highland Homeless Trust is a charity, a local charity. It works in Inverness and throughout Highland. We deliver housing support services to vulnerable people. Uh, that's males and females from the age of 16 onwards. We also have some specialist services for uh, young people who have been formerly looked after children. Uh, and Ryan and Matthew join me here today to give evidence to the committee. Alec Johnston, member for North East Scotland. Matthew Fries, Highland Homeless Trust. Um, since last time um, I attended the committee, um, a lot has happened um, in the space of two years. Um, I first went to the Highland Homeless Trust, uh, you know, as someone seeking homeless accommodation, and I'm now in the process of looking to my first tenancy, um, which will be happening in the next few weeks. Um, there's been a lot of ups and downs, as there is for a lot of young people that are care experienced, um, particularly with becoming homeless in terms of what's available, um, service provision, and what help there is. Um, one of the biggest difficulties I've found is as the older you get, there seems to be, I don't know if it's lack of resource, but um, uh, they become more reluctant, the local authority, in terms of wanting to provide support. Um, I, you know, help with sustaining um, college, university placements, um, and the support that's required for that. So, but I can touch upon that a bit. Later. Good morning, Christian Arad, Member of Parliament for North East of Scotland. Hi, uh, my name's Jill Moss. I'm a Level 1 support worker with Y People. Um, we work with uh, young people aged 16 to 25 um, in our supported accommodation uh, residents. And uh, our main aim is to prepare these young people for moving on to their own tenancies, uh, gaining different skills uh, to help them with that regarding, you know, budgeting, uh, um, education, things like that, so, yeah. Hi, I'm Ashton Jusson. I'm uh, in support of the accommodation with Y people. Paul McMahon, MSP for Central Scotland. Hi, I'm Jordan Murray. I was previously a tenant at Y people C4000. I continue to work closely with them, even though I'm now at my university course, and I'm the chairperson of the RTO at C4000. I'm Marco Biaggi. I'm the MSP representing Edinburgh Central. I'm Charlene McKellar. I work for Who Cares Scotland as a policy development assistant. When I was growing up, I didn't have positive relationships in my life. I grew up in kinship care and also experienced homelessness for nine years. Um, and part of that, I was 
sleeping rough on the streets for six weeks. Um, at this stage, I would just like to thank the committee for having us here today and being part of this. Hello, I'm Claudia MacDonald. I'm the Head of Communications at Who Care Scotland. Um, Who Care Scotland is the only independent advocacy organisation um, that has the sole mantra of speaking up and speaking out for Scotland's care experienced individuals. Uh, we work across all of Scotland and we support young people through our advocacy up until they are 25 years of age. Hi, I'm Connor Chalmers. Um, I'm a looked after young person. I have been since the age of eight. Um, I'm also a policy development assistant for Who Care Scotland and I've always had to fight to keep the supports that I have um, and also to keep the placements that I have and I'm still currently having to do so today. Good morning. John Finney, MSP Highlands and Islands. Convener, can I refer to my uh, register of interest? I'm a director of the Highland Homeless Trust. Uh, indeed, I know both Paul and Matthew well and I now know Ryan. Um, in that position, of course, I have no input to day-to-day -day operations but, uh, or, or indeed what will be said today. Okay, th thank you all very much um, for coming along and giving us an update. Can I start the questions and ask um, some of the young people if they'd like to give us an example, if you want, of how you became homeless? Would anybody ask you, would you like to? Yeah. I just had a bit of a follow-up with my mum, I suppose, and our house was overcrowded enough, so she asked me to leave. And that's that. Did you, did you get any support I've, once you left? I've been in homeless accommodation for about a month now, and I've, they've been fantastic with help. I've now, I've, they've helped me with everything that I've needed, sorry. But I've not been in care of that before. So this is just a recent thing yeah. for you as well, OK. And the support you've got so far has been it's helpful? It's been really helpful, aye. That's good. Anybody else? Yeah, Charlene. Um, I became homeless because uh, I had a family breakdown, um, but I was actually in kinship care um, for five years with my other siblings. Um, and when I was going through that process, um, I had a social worker when I moved into my kinship care um, for three years, and then it got changed. I had no communication with that social worker. Um, and when I became homeless, I had no, no one to give me advice, no one to turn to for support. Um, and I struggled, and that's how I ended up in the streets for six weeks with no one to turn to, not even knowing where the Hamish Allen Centre is. Young people should know this stuff, and we, we don't. And we need to, as people in Scotland, need to be letting young people know where they can go for this kind of support. Because I never got it, and I'm one of Scotland's people. Do you think that's information that should be given out in schools then? Totally. That's, yeah. that's the places that it, it needs to hit. But then we need to remember that not all kids in care or kids in general don't go to school or they're getting schooled at home. Um, so it's finding a way that we can actually reach out and get their kids as well rather than just the kids in the schools. But definitely something needs to be done about that. Have you got any ideas how you would do that, being a young person? What, sorry? Have you got any ideas how you would reach, reach out to those other young people that don't go to school? Um, well, one, they should have... Have an independent um, worker, no matter what, because um, obviously they're struggling. So they should at least have an advocacy worker. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they don't get that. And I don't understand why they don't get that. Like, I was in kinship care. I didn't know that there was advocacy places out there for me. And I know for a fact that if I had that from day one, I wouldn't have experienced being in homelessness for nine years and also sleeping on the streets for six weeks. I just think that's atrocious, you know. We're trying to change Scotland for the best, and I think we really need to kind of work together and try to make something better for kids that are needing the advice, because there's plenty of kids out there that, that need that kind of support and advice, and they're just not getting it. How old were you when you were sleeping in the streets? What, sorry? How old were you when you um, I was 16 years of age. Um, I was still trying to study at the same time, so I was still going to school. Um, I found ways to, to wash myself, take clothing to certain day centres that I knew was there, but I didn't find that information out until my sister told me that. Now, that's my sibling, um, and I shouldn't need to go to my sister for that information. I should go to somebody in my local authority and say, right, I'm homeless, what, what do I do about this? But there's no advice out there on how young people can reach out 
to people to help them and support them. And you've now got a job now as well? And I've now got two jobs. <laughs> I work for um, Who Cares? Mm -hmm. And I also work for Quarriers doing housing peer support. That's fantastic, particularly from your background. So you can really empathise with the young people and give them the help totally. and advice. Totally. I, they I need. know the struggles that they go through. And mm -hmm. if they, they feel that they want to give up their tenancy, um, the only way it is is to support them and mm -hmm. walk with them through that path because that's mm -hmm. what they need. They don't need somebody telling them what to do. They just need somebody to guide them. Mm -hmm. Can you remind me again how old you are? Um, I'm 25 years of age. 25. You've loved a lot in those 25 years, haven't you? Yep. Well done for what you've actually achieved so far. Um, Connor, do you want to say anything about how you became homeless? Well, I've never actually experienced homelessness. Um, but as I said in my introduction, I've always had to fight to make sure that that didn't happen. Um, I've also had to make sure I can keep the supports that I've got and fight to remain in placements. But um, as Charlene was saying, that's all about the power of having an independent advocate because the reason I was able to do that and still remain within a looked after placement at the moment is because I had an advocate guiding me through every step of the way and at every speed bump, the advocate was always there to get me over that. Um, and any time I needed advice on what to do or who I could turn to or anything like that, that advocate was always there and was a key factor. Um, and at this point in time, there is also a similar situation going on that I'm having to fight to try and keep the current placement that I'm in just now, um, because there's been a plan put in place for me to move into my own accommodation. However, I don't feel ready for this to happen. So along with my advocate, um, we've been sort of um, fighting our case, if you will, so that I can remain um, that's, that's um, pretty much that, but to what Charlene said, I think if you've got an advocate and you've got someone there who's able to tell you, like, you know, this is what you should be expecting and, that, you know, no, you don't have to move on unless you're ready, um, it makes life a hell of a lot easier and would decrease the chances, I would imagine, of someone actually ending up homeless. And how old are you? Um, I'm 19 years old. 19. Thank you very much. Ryan, do you want to say anything? Or... Are you OK? OK. Uh, thanks very much for that. Um, we'll now open up the questions to the, the rest of the committee and maybe we could move on, since we were talking about housing just now, on to housing issues. Marco, is there anything you would like to ask? Yeah, I mean, th there's the, the great new housing options approach that we hear about a lot at this level with the... Uh, Council supposed to be running housing options teams that can provide you with uh, advice if you get into to housing difficulties. I'd be interested to know about anybody's direct experience with those, and you know, if if you have had a direct experience, has it been a good one? So just say anybody wants to ask any questions, if you could just put them through the chair, and we'll just take your names in order, okay? Anybody want to answer Marco's question? I mean, has anybody dealt with a housing options team at mm -hmm. local authority? Yes, Paul. Um, I think uh, Marco is right. Housing options um, is being rolled out across Scotland and delivered by local authorities as uh, a method, perhaps, to identify the housing solution that's most appropriate for the individual that's in a point of crisis. Um, my, my experience, my own personal experience in Highland is that um, housing options is clearly dependent on the resources that are available to uh, deliver the various options that might be identified. And in practice, um, the range of housing options that are presented to young people and others who are in housing crisis is very limited indeed and certainly doesn't lead to any kind of immediate resolution to the housing problem, um, other than perhaps what would have happened in the past anyway, which in Highland tends to be some form of temporary emergency accommodation. So I think the, the housing uh, options framework is there, but uh, hasn't really led to any great or significant material difference in service delivery or um, availability of housing solutions. Would anybody else like to comment on that? Yes, um, Claudia. I think from our experience as an um, independent advocacy organisation, um, we have 
we welcome the housing's options approach, um, but we are also um, very frustrated by what is essentially a lack of options for care leavers. Um, we have to remember the background that care leavers come from. You, they come from a background where they are, on any given day of the week, they're usually engaging with about five different professionals, that's different adults, in a way that non looked after peers aren't. And when it comes to a point of disengaging with those care providers, uh, and when they have to present to a whole new range of adult services, which is effectively what the housing's option approach is, um, reluctance to do that is understandable. It's also quite scary. It's also quite overwhelming. And it also involves negotiating a whole new set of different criteria, um, delving into your past, and trying to articulate, um, usually on your own, what you want from, from, your, home, from your housing situation. I think the other sort of additional uh, frustration with the uh, uh, housing experiences of care leavers upon leaving care is that sometimes things don't work out. And that's sort of reflective of um, that transition from, you know, becoming a teenager to becoming a young adult to then making your way in life. And when things don't work out for care leavers, the fallbacks aren't really there. You know, there's not mum or dad to go back to. There's not the sort of um, wider support networks that we would probably want for our own children. Um, but unfortunately, there's an inflexibility, um, which relates to what Paul said about the, the resources that are available. There's an inflexibility to, to, um, to be able to kind of deal with that. And again, if you can imagine the impact that has on that young person to then renegotiate that whole new service or that whole new discussion again can be quite overwhelming and in many cases off-putting. And that's why young people may um, find themselves homeless. They may find themselves uh, sofa surfing. They may find themselves on the street. And obviously that's what we don't want for uh, young people that were looked after by our state. Anyone else? Can, can I just could, could I just ask a little follow-up to that? Do you think because there's always going to be an element of people presenting to, to local authorities, whether that's <coughs> called housing as options or, or whatever it is, what's the best way to make that friendly, as friendly as possible for, for young people and care leavers in particular? Is it specialist staff within that that can deal with those per people that come from those particular backgrounds, or is it something else? Yeah, I think... Um I think what you say there is correct. I also think we have a very unique legislative opportunity just now via the Children and Young People Act, um, which, if it is followed through in practice, should effectively mean that no young care leaver should have to rely on our homelessness legislation to find accommodation. Um, the other thing that we probably have to try to get better at is, um, about w is with working with young people. We have an opportunity also via Part 4 of the Children and Young People Act to plan, to plan beyond the immediate day-to-day um, -day living experience or placement experience of that young person to encourage them to think about what they want beyond 15, 16, 17 years of age. We must encourage young people to take advantage of the new legislative provisions in Part 9 of the Act, which is the sorry, Part 10 of the Act, which is a continuing care law. And we must give young people every single opportunity they have to determine their own path in life and to feel they have control of that. The other opportunity, which we're also encouraged about with the Act, is that um, there's an expansion of corporate parents in Scotland from April 2015. That effectively means that every um, public body, more or less, is um, charged with taking into account the lives, experiences and the well-being of a looked-after child and a young care leaver. What we need to see, though, is that the strategic direction of corporate parents, the plans, the single outcome agreements, the indicators that determine how uh, corporate parents are delivering services and how well they're doing that for Scotland's looked after population is transferred to the frontline staff. Frontline staff must know what it is to be a looked after child uh, in Scotland, what that means. It means not a typical home environment. It means having to deal with a lot of adults from a very, very young age. And it means having to always justify why you need something. So I think um, we have an opportunity to, to really make that happen. Um, and we're encouraged by the legislation. We just hope that that sees its way through to, to, to practice. Paul? You. Um, Claudia has given a very clear statement of uh, the opportunities and the potential improvements that are available uh, around Scotland. I'd just like to emphasise that um, the difficulties and challenges faced by young people uh, don't relate exclusively to looked after or formerly looked after children. I think as an organisation increasingly we are coming across uh, young people 16 plus who have had no history at all in the care system but uh, are finding themselves homeless at a very young age. And whilst the situation for care leavers isn't perfect, far from perfect, it's significantly worse 
for those young people who don't have a history in care and don't receive the priority services and the privileged access to services that uh, formerly looked after children do. They are at a real disadvantage. Dill, would you maybe want to comment on it from my people's point of view? The, the issue that we, well, one of the issues that we have um, at the moment with uh, accommodating our young homeless people is that um, there seems to be a lack in accommodation for um, our young people with either mental health issues or learning disability. Um, and what happens is, a, you know, it's a a 14 bedded residence uh, that I work in at the moment and I feel strongly um, that there should be smaller units for more kind of one-to-one -one support with our young people that have either mental health issues or a uh, learning disability uh, issues but we don't have that um, you know and they're all in the one building and there's a lot of peer pressure and different things so there's you know, there's definitely a lack uh, of resources for um, people in situations like that. And when, when people do move on through past the emergency accommodation stage into the idea of trying to get into the, the, the long term, the permanent tenancies, usually tenancies anyway, are there, are there issues there with landlords, availability? I mean, how, how realistic is that as a step of the way it's being done at the moment? What we tend to have just now um, is a lack of uh, one-bedroom properties. Uh, we try and encourage our young people to look for uh, or apply for one-bedroom properties, but we don't seem to have uh, a lot of them in the area that, that we are certain in at the moment. Uh, and, of course, with the new bedroom tax and things, it's... It's all added pressure um, if they've got to then pay for a second, a second bedroom and things. And if they're on a, a low income to start with, I, you know, so bringing in the new bedroom tax wasn't a, really a good idea, I don't think. I was asked uh, how realistic that is. Um, it, it was never particularly realistic. It's become less realistic. Uh, as a result of uh, changes to the welfare state implemented by the UK government. We've had uh, young people redefined from 25 to 35, which puts pressure on uh, existing housing stock, particularly in the private sector. Um, we've had the bedroom taxes uh, Jill is talking about. We've got other things like direct payments. The, the changes to the welfare state have made it much harder for people who are challenged and vulnerable to access the full range of housing stock that is available, and much more importantly, to sustain that accommodation once they're in it. Um, people are experiencing real hardship of that, there's no doubt. We have enough landlords coming forward? Pardon? We have enough landlords coming forward, enough people willing to make properties available for uh, well, young people? Well, I, I, think, um, I think there are challenges around that as well. And, uh, the, the number of landlords is limited. It always was limited. I think increasingly now with uh, um, changes that involve things like direct payment of what used to be housing benefit to uh, people who are in a private sector rent makes landlords ex extremely sceptical about taking on people who are reliant on benefits to pay their rent. I think a number of people inevitably have uh, um, fallen into arrears with their rent and landlords have had to bear the, bear the brunt of that. And I think that means that increasingly we see accommodation being rented and there'll be, uh, there'll be a disclaimer on the advert saying something like, no, you know, people and benefits don't apply, you know, words to that effect. Uh, John, I think, wants to come in in the back of something. Yeah, well, it was the point about the one bedroom uh, flats or whatever. Um, I mean, should we assume that it's best for everybody to have their own flat or should we assume, I mean, the government, the UK government seems to assume it's best for everybody to share, or is it just on a kind of case-by-case basis that for some people it's best on their own and for some people it's best to share? I think um, what we're talking about is sort of 
a, a system uh, where a lack of resources is dictating needs rather than is sort of dictating what resources should be available. I think we have to have a personalised approach to accommodating our young people, um, particularly uh, young people that are already at the margins of society because they're typically, caregivers are typically excluded from the labour market, they don't tend to be represented well in higher and further education, they tend to be disproportionately represented in um, homelessness and our youth justice system and our adult justice system. And I think we really have to um, try to endeavour um, to, to to, to, to allocate um, housing um, and ultimately sort of putting roots down for young people to, to build in a home based around what they need. For some of our young people, um, they do want to share. I think the extreme or the stark reality of going potentially from a residential unit where you're around maybe five up to 15 young people at any one time to then living in isolation, usually in an area that you've not had much control or say over where, where that house is, and also quite detached from the connections you once had whilst in care can be terrifying for care leavers. It can cause a uh, serious um, mental um, sort of impact, emotional instability, and it ultimately um, sort of doesn't allow them to kind of make the path in life that we would want them to make. So I think a personalised approach is one that uh, we would always recommend because I think that mimics what we would be expecting for um, people that have choice and people that have opportunities to, to have control over where they live and how they live, etc. Um, so I think we have to have a personalised uh, framework for that. Matthew, could you give us an overview from, say, your point of view of what it was like actually moving out of care into supporting yourself? Yes, well, I first went into the care system when I was 11. Um, I briefly left when I just turned 16 um, to move back home with my mum. Um, I had a college placement. Um, but the, the first thing I noticed as soon as I left was the doors were sort of slammed shut behind me. You know, so going from this environment where, you know, I've been so used to for, you know, a period of years, um, familiar faces, you know, it, it was quite a large unit as well, to all of a sudden going back to something that was actually quite alien to me and that was living at home with my mum. Um, on top of that, my mum suffered a brain injury, so she's quite severely disabled. Um, so there, so there, was, there was a breakdown. Um, so I went back in August 2011, and there was a, a breakdown within a matter of months in terms of my relationship with my mum, um, because there was no supports in place, and the college placement fell through. Um, I found myself back in care on a voluntary basis um, in the same unit that I was in previously. And just, I think it was 16 and a half, um, the local authority um, sought to remove my Section 70 supervision order, which resulted in them being allowed to then pull the funding for my residential placement. So I was back in a place where it wasn't perfect, um, but it was familiar to me. Um, it was a place of safety, and as a result of my age, they decided to pull the funding because it was deemed too expensive, and they didn't have the, the financial resources um, to sustain it. So as a consequence, because I couldn't return home, because I couldn't stay in you, you know, a place I felt safe, um, I had no option but to seek homeless accommodation. Um, which is when I had to approach the Highland Homeless Trust. So. How did they help you? Well, they have a unit called Plainfield House, which is a shared support accommodation for six formerly looked after young people. So I was fortunate that there was still a room available um, because when I first heard about Plainfield, um, the waiting list was huge. So I, I was lucky enough to get in there. Um, they provide 24 hour support. Um, you're allocated a key worker like you would be in a residential setting. Um, you're allocated, um, I believe it's six hours a week in terms of support, so that's enough to tackle things like, you know, if you're involved with a job centre, you need help with benefits, form filling, etc., doctor's appointments. Um, but one of, one of the biggest difficulties with going to a place like that, coming from a residential setting, you know, that was very restrictive in terms of what you can do, 
you know, you were very detached from mainstream society um, because quite often these units are in the middle of nowhere. And I think one of the reasons for that is because some of them are massive, you know, and it's unrealistic to put a young person into somewhere and try and call it a house, you know, when there's 12 other young people, five, six members of staff, you know, there's nothing realistic about that. Um, you, you know, you know, and it's, it's it's a completely false picture of what real life is, you know, and also the fact that the, there's not enough sort of the, there's, there's not a great enough emphasis on these homes, you, you know, preparing young people for independent living. You know, in my view, if I had help at 14, um, you know, starting to prepare for the transition to independent living, given that the vast majority of young people. Um, you know, leave care very early, you know, then they're not going to ha have the same safety net as, um, you know, their mainstream counterparts in terms of they've got, f you know, family to go back to, things like that. So, yeah, so so I, I, I went to Plainfield House where things did improve, but, you know, they were, they were very slow in improving. Um, one, of, one, of my, one of my views with through care um, and aftercare accommodation is Plainfield House is meant to be a transition from residential to independent living. Now, what I've found since I've been there, a lot of the young people coming through the door feel they need a transition for the transition. So there's something wrong, you know, and I think one of the problems is the age that they're going into somewhere like Plainfield House, you know, quite often it's 16 years of age. Now, if you imagine being in almost what feels like a prison you know, for a large period of your um, life, and then all of a sudden to be handed the freedom to go out at whatever time you want to, um, no restrictions as to what you can do. You know, you, you you know you could potentially be at Plainfield two, maybe three years. You know, you're going to use that time burning up that newfound freedom that you have, and if you do want to sort of get yourself sorted at the end of that, you know, and move forward, you know, the time's up. You know, and that's the difficulty. So, I think Alex wants to come in in that. Well, the, Matthew's just covered one of the questions that I wanted to ask in greater detail, uh, and I thought it would be an appropriate opportunity to uh, sort of extend that uh, and ask you know, both uh, people who have used the, the support mechanisms and people who are running the support mechanisms about the relationship with local authorities, if local authorities are providing what you expect them to provide, and to what extent are voluntary uh, organisations having to step in and fill the gaps in what local authorities ought to be providing? Do you want to answer or will I pick a victim? Or do you want, do you want to sort of explain it again? No, again? The, we are, you know, we're, we're talking about a system here where local authorities are supposedly uh, providing uh, the support that is required. Uh, and we've heard that some of you have had difficulty uh, in establishing a relationship with local authorities. So to what extent are local authorities fulfilling the requirements that we presume are placed on them? And to what extent are you having to bypass the, the local authorities and go to voluntary organisations such as the one repre ones represented around this table to do that job? Oh dear. Um, I don't want to speak on behalf of Charlene and Connor, but just to sort of uh, pick up on the very valid point um, that unfortunately sometimes the negotiation between a young person and a local authority can be quite complex. And it's complex for a variety of reasons. Um, we know that there's um, resource issues amongst local authorities um, and we appreciate that. However, what we as an advocacy organisation are finding is that young people are told um, different things by different departments effectively in local authorities. Unfortunately, um, we have had instances, um, Connor uh, unfortunately is one of those young people that has been told by one aspect or facet of a local authority that, well, we can't do anything for you because your case is now closed. Effectively, what has been said to Connor, bearing in mind that Connor is a looked after child, bearing in mind that the state has intervened in his family life and removed him from that. So we are saying to Connor, um, you're not important enough because the case says that you're closed. That's not OK. And unfortunately, that can then leave a lasting impact on Connor and any other young people's ability or desire to want to go and talk to other facets of a local authority. That's where we find, unfortunately, that the rights, the legislative rights, and I think we have to acknowledge that, housing and homelessness 
Um, legislative rights in Scotland are very advanced, they're very comprehensive. Um, but despite that, unfortunately, um, local uh, authorities are not always informing young people of what their rights are. And that's where uh, we find that we are asked to help quite a lot. Um, and that usually is just to have a conversation with a, you, you know, a, a sort of housing officer or another uh, part of a, a local authority, a frontline officer, um, have a conversation about what rights are being impeded upon. Um, but, and that's, that's not okay. And that's why we really need rights realised. Um, unfortunately, we know from what Charlene said, and you've heard it at the top of, at the, top of the conversation, Charlene didn't know that there were organisations or people out there that could help her realise what was entitled to her. Um, and where we, will, where we have instances where rights are being infringed upon or not realised, we must provide safeguards to that or else we will constantly have young people um, disenfranchised from statutory provisions and legal rights that they are entitled to. I don't, Connor, I don't know if you, if you want to add anything uh, to what that felt like to be told that, that your case was closed and, you know... Well, I think for... I think for a local authority to tell anyone that, oh, you know, your case is closed or, you know, this is the plan we've put in place for you, so this is... This is what's going to happen, and you don't really have a choice in the matter. Um, it's not a nice feeling, um, because one of the things local authorities are supposed to be sort of encouraging for young people and advocating for young people is that sort of independence and teaching them how to be independent. Um, so to totally take all power out of their hands altogether and just say to them, well, you know, your case is closed. This is what's going to happen deal with it. Um, it's, it contradicts everything that they've been trying to do the past, well, for me anyway, the past 11 years um, that I've been looked after by the local authority. Um, and I would say as well, I think that a lot of the time with local authorities, you see quite often that social workers themselves don't always, they do sometimes, but they don't always properly necessarily know a lot about the rights of the young person that they're supposed to be advocating for, so therefore they don't tell the young person and they have to then go, you know, as a young person you then have to go looking for other services. Um, I was fortunate enough that I knew of the other services um, purely because of other family members and stuff like that. Um, so I knew these services existed um, and was able to, to use them. Um, I think, you know, at the minute, there's still an ongoing um, thing between me and my authority because my standpoint is purely don't teach me to be an independent person and then take all of that away from me by just removing me altogether from your system um, because there is absolutely no point in teaching me any of the stuff you've taught me if you're just going to throw me out at the end of the day. Thank you very much. Before I bring Paul in, can I ask very briefly if you can answer really quickly as well? Do you think social media would help you to raise awareness of the help and support that's out there? You know, simple things from some of the organisations that are sitting around the, the table today, tweeting information or putting it on the telly or billboards or Facebook or whatever. Do you think young people would access that information as well? Definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Without a doubt, young people would read it, but it actually needs to be young people friendly, because if it's not, then they're not going to like pay attention to it or take it on board. Um, I personally feel, and I go on about this all the time, like there needs to be a lot of information out there for young people, um, because where I became homeless, I was walking about the city centre, and you'll find like there's other homeless people sitting there, like begging on the street and stuff but there's no help and support for them and they probably don't know where to go for that. And if they walk past like a bus stop and there's something saying, this is where you can go for help and support, then that's going to attract them, you know? If it's even just a number or a, a map or something, you know, so that they can find a place that they can actually go and receive help and support. Because I think it's wrong that young people don't actually know where to go for help. Can I ask again? Sorry, I feel as if I'm kind of hogging it, but I don't mean to. It's just a good lead-in. The organisations that's around the table, how do you let young people know 
that's not within your system, that you're actually there to help them. How do you get that message out? Why people, the Highland Trust and yourself, how do you let those young people know those, that the help and support's there, Jill? Uh, well, as far as I'm led to believe, anyway, it would be through our, our website, but that's probably about as far as it goes. Um, yeah, I agree with uh, what the young lady's saying there. It's, there's definitely a lack of information out there, uh, without a doubt. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. And then Jordan. I think uh, your question comes back to uh, Alex's earlier question about relationships. Um, and I think the, the range of relationships that young people are uh, required and expected to negotiate uh, when working their way through the care system and then into uh, the wider community as an independent adult is extremely complicated. Not all of those relationships are successful. And I think uh, that's an area that uh, uh, Charlene, I think, has talked about and highlighted uh, as uh, being evidential of cracks in the system that young people can fall through and do fall through. Um, and I think that highlights the importance of transitions. Uh, my, my opinion would be that uh, the transitions that young people and others uh, have to experience as they move through their life are extremely difficult. That's compounded by the range of relationships that they're required to go uh, and address and develop uh, with professionals and also in terms of their own personal relationships and social networks. Um, it's a very difficult situation. Um, when you look at the range of relationships there, some of them are quite poor, some of them are not successful. And I think that extends into work and relationships between partner agencies. Sometimes it works very well, sometimes there are tensions. Often there are tensions within various departments, within local authorities, uh, lack of knowledge sometimes, misinformation, misadvice, all of the things that we've heard. Um, they contribute to the situation uh, clearly and they compound the difficulties and the hardship faced by young people. And uh, I think we could say that we're not making it easy for young people to, uh, to um, work their way through all of those transitions and into a life of uh, successful and independent living. Your organisation, the Highland, was it Highland Homeless Trust, do you only deal with referrals or the, the young girl Asht, Ashton wasn't in the system, is that correct? Yeah, and you became homeless uh, and left home. You weren't in the system, you uh, just left I've home. Been in the so she never came through the system. So how, how if she lived in the Highlands, would she know, not being caught up in the system and aware that your organisation is there, how do you reach out to those groups of people? That's what I'm trying to say. Not people that's already in the system, but people that, through no fault of their own, become homeless and they need help. Mm. How do they know in the Highlands that you're there to help them? Well, again, I think, coming back to the point I made earlier, um, around uh, the, the, the notion that looked after children and formerly looked after children are in the system. They are uh, identified and they are known about and they do have privileged access to support and guidance from a range of agencies. We have another group of young people who have never been in the system but who find themselves homeless or at some other point of crisis in their life at a very young age, 16. And typically they will come to my organisation normally because they've been required to present as homeless to the local authority um, and at that stage there might have been some social work involvement. So it's reactive, it's not proactive and I think that's a significant issue and it stops agencies like my own um, working, what I might say, reflexively with young people. Um, we are only coming into contact with them after a significant amount of damage has already been impacted upon their life. Uh, Jordan? I, um, when I became homeless at the age of 16, I was luckily still at school, so there was support there available. And that's how I actually, um, sorry, that's how I actually got in touch with Why People, because I got in touch with uh, the school and they put me on to the head teacher. It was still during the uh, Christmas holidays, because it was Boxing Day I became homeless. Um, I then got in touch with the headmaster of the school, who then referred me to social work. Because I'd never had any previous social work involvement, 
they put my case to the side immediately and they didn't talk to me because I was already 16. So then the school had to go about themselves and actually organise that with white people so that I was supported social work because I had no previous social work involvement already at the age of 16. There was no support available for me there and that's something that does need to be addressed immediately. Um, can, I, can I just ask you if you feel you're lucky that you happen to have the right people? within the school who could do that? Yeah, definitely. Luckily for myself, I was actually very good friends with the headmaster's daughter, which is how I was able to get in touch with him directly. But there are young people out there who aren't in school, who don't have these relationships and perhaps don't go to a school that's as supportive as my school was, and they're not able to get that. I was extremely fortunate that I was only a few days out sleeping at a neighbour's house before I was managed to get into why people, um, luckily, have never had to sleep on the streets. But um, for people that do do that, there is no way for them to go and get the support. This was presented to me by my school. Um, they went and did the work for that, and they, were com they did that of their own accord, because social work just put it to the side. Can we move on now? Because I know you want to say and ask some, make some statements about education and that. And I know Christian has got some questions he wants to ask about education, employment and housing as well. So can I pass over to you, Christian? Yes, thanks very much. Uh, I would like to start with... Uh, uh, what was talked about by Paul about welfare reform and by Jill about bedroom tax. But I would like to ask uh, young people, how do they feel um, the states operate? How, how do you feel when you come into the secure accommodation, how secure it is? I know Connor talk, talked about it. Uh, is the bedroom tax, is the welfare reforms, is it something in your radar? Is it something, how, do, how, how the impact goes on young people who secure that accommodation? How do you feel? Uh, uh, do you feel that you uh, somehow uh, feel insecure be because of it? Or I, I would like to know if you've got any experience of, of, of this letters, the letters you receive, for example. Um, well, see, I've never been in my own accommodation, um, although that's not for the one to try, I must say. Um, but I think from what I've heard, you know, for just people here today and you know, um, certainly siblings who are in their own accommodation. Um, it's not easy and it's not an easy feeling. And I think as well, a lot of the time, when you, people talk about homelessness, you think on the streets and stuff like that. But when you move into a house, that's not a home. That's a house and you're expected to pay things like bedroom tax and stuff like that. And I think, like I say, it's quite a difficult one because I haven't been in my own accommodation. But I would say that Try to figure it out. What I would say is I think that to make young people properly feel like their home is their home, there has to be appropriate supports, but then I would also say that there has to be something that helps towards things like bedroom tax and that, because not all young people who move into their own accommodation have employment, which means they're therefore maybe having to sign on, um, which I've had to do myself in the past. That is not an easy thing to do. Um, and the level of things like tax, like you were talking about, you have to pay, it makes it difficult to settle in a particular home. And for young people, um, in particular anyway, from my experience, from young people who have been in a care background and young people, even to some extent, some young people who haven't, but have had sort of rough childhoods and stuff like that, they're already in vulnerable positions. And to put them in a house and expect them to know how to cope with all these different things is making them far more vulnerable um, and their self-esteem levels, which are already low, go below rock bottom as well because they just feel as though, how am I supposed to support myself? Who's out there to help me? Um, you know, why am I being left myself? Is it something I've done? And all these questions constantly run through your mind. Um, and I just think there has to be something more concrete for these young people so that they're not just being thrown into the wilderness and themselves and expected to know what to do straight away. So talking, sorry, if I, if I can add that, to, talking to, and maybe other young people can give their experience, uh, to have that secure accommodation and, and be on your own is, is too daunting because of what you hear from your sibling or from your friends who are in that situation? Is, it, is that a difficult transition to make? Um, I would say it is a difficult transition. Um, it's a scary transition. Um, I don't think, certainly, if you looked after 
point of view. I don't think there is enough preparation for it. Um, so I think that makes it even more difficult um, because no one teaches you the basic things that you need to know to move into something that's supposed to be yours. Um, you know, like I remember leaving uh, the unit I stayed in and I didn't really know how to do a lot. I didn't know how to properly do a washing like in a washing machine and stuff like that. Um, cooking, I kind of knew about cooking, but that was more from school than it was from the actual children's unit that I had lived in at the time. Um, and just other basic things like basic household skills, like if you buy something, like a cupboard or something like that from a shop, you need to know how to build it so you can use it. But no one teaches you how to do that. Um, no one teaches you the necessary budgeting skills either. So you can set out a plan if you get paid monthly or whatever. So you can set out a plan each month to say, right, that's my money for electricity, that's my money for gas, this is my money for food. No one shows you all those things. Um, and I think that, I just think there has to be more preparation. People have to know how to do this in order for them to feel secure in their own accommodation. Jordan. Something extremely important that I'd like to bring up is um, throughout my school life I was dead set on going to university and then my homelessness did affect that to some extent and suddenly I wasn't doing as well in school and I was really struggling. Luckily I did manage to get into university and after building bridges with my mum again, to be able to claim a student loan you needed to clear your parents' income regardless if you've been homeless. You need to be out of that system for more than three years, out of education and working with a certain income to claim as an independent student. This meant that when I went to uni I had to declare my mother's income. Luckily, I was able to get a good enough rate to keep going at uni. I did manage to, I have got into some debt that I've managed to get out of now as I have a full-time job over the summer. However, there are many students who have been homeless that now have to live in their own accommodation, who then have to give up their dreams of having a degree, simply because they cannot afford to come off their benefits. There is no benefit system available to students that are in higher education to claim housing costs. This means they have to then go to the discretionary funds at the university. The problem with this is, children who have come from a high income family, who still do not get any support from their family, or people who cannot get hold of the relevant P6s and documents have to claim a non-income assessed loan. This means that they cannot, declaim, and they cannot claim the discretionary fund that universities provide. This means they're having to give this up. I'd like to see something implemented where people who have been homeless in the past for more than three months, for example, are able to claim some level of benefit towards their housing. Because say they're only getting the, um, the non-income assessed loan currently stands at £475 per month. That's not enough to pay travel costs, rent, university fees, um, well, university costs, things like books, etc. It's simply not enough. And this is an equal opportunities committee here. And we need to make sure that everyone has got the chance to go on and have a higher education. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Paul. Um, I think uh, uh, Christian asked about uh, uh, experience of benefits and, and uh, so on. I think Connor has highlighted the fact that um, the experience of the benefit system doesn't typically start until an individual has moved on and they're, they're living independently. Um, and I think when that happens, what we are seeing now is that uh, there are significant delays in claims being settled. That leads to a significant amount of uncertainty on the part of the individual, which creates a lot of worry and hardship. That uncertainty isn't alleviated until the claim is settled, and that can be a number of months. Um, I think uh, with the, the benefit system generally, I think uh, uh, certainly in the Highlands, Inverness in particular, um, universal credit has now been piloted. The administration of that seems to be uh, complicated, unnecessarily complicated and poor, leading to uh, a great deal of confusion and contributing to the uncertainty. And I think when you've got vulnerable people who are trying to engage with that system, which must be done electronically, um, that leads to sanctions being imposed on, on individuals and the loss of benefit contributing to the problems again. So um, to answer Kristen's question directly, I think um, the impact is one of uncertainty, significant levels of uncertainty, and uh, that is impacting upon the individual's ability to move forward with their life. In a, in a significant way. Thank you, Christian. 
Thanks very much, Chauvet. And if I want to go back into education as well, uh, talk, I know you have a very good experience, and, and, and it's fantastic the way you went through, and you said it yourself, through your own connections, your personal connection. We heard about Charlene as well. I would like to know if other young people can give us an idea of this, if they felt that uh, they were sanctioned because the fact that they were homeless, maybe um, they were at college, and I know if, if you miss certain days at college, uh, you, you can end up uh, out, out, out of the course. So is there any young people who can give us some idea at secondary school, at that college as well, if they felt, or maybe, you know, if they wanted to go into university and thought it was not possible? Uh, what, what are their experience? Charlie, do you want me? I can't really hear what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, it's just about the, 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 your experience when you were at secondary school. You said that it was quite difficult, but you managed. Uh, did you feel maybe your secondary school was very good to you, but do you think that maybe uh, you didn't receive that positive uh, uh, response from your secondary school and maybe other uh, uh, young people didn't get that, that positive response to the contrary, maybe uh, were told that uh, they couldn't stay at college or, or they will be penalised if, if they missed more, more of the school they, they already missed? Um, well, with my situation, like obviously being homeless and attending school is quite difficult itself. Um, and I, to, to be honest with you, I didn't want anybody to know that I was sleeping in the streets because it's no one else's business, it's my business and it's for me to deal with. But the main two things that stopped me from doing that was trust and relationships. I had no trust with anybody, had no relationships with any teachers because they were so mean against me, because I had be behavioural problems, you know. I'm there for a reason, I'm not, I'm there to get educated, I'm not there to be spoken to as if I'm somebody like one of their friends or that um i think it's really difficult for young people that are living in supported accommodations and um in hostels to get into any sort of training or education unless it's voluntarily um i tried for several several years to get into college and um, to do nc and social care because that's what i wanted to do but because i had been living in a supported accommodation, it came down to the money fact. Everything in this this planet is about money, and it shouldn't be about money. It should be about giving the, the kids, whether you're from a care background or you're living with your parents, every kid should have an opportunity of some sort of education and training, but it doesn't happen. And I, I don't understand why Scotland would be somebody that stops young people from getting an education because that's what's going to make people, you know, getting training, getting them into employment. I struggled, don't get me wrong, and just going on the back of the hand of the other, I was trying to get in to ask a question. I, I've had to give up my own tenancy, the one that I fought for, for years and years. I've had to give that up because my the debt that I got into because I didn't know how to pay rent. I didn't know how to pay gas and electricity because I'd never done it in a supported accommodation. Nobody showed me how to do that. Um, I was forced into that, that flat. I didn't know that there was two or three options that you could get under the Section 5. Um, and the fact that um, when I moved into my tenancy, I had support workers for six weeks. And I asked for extra time with them so that I could learn how to... I know how to budget, but I didn't know how to pay my, like my rent and do short and you know, all your basic stuff. I didn't have that. Like They stuck with me for six weeks. And the reason, I asked for a reason on behind that, because there's always a reason to something in life. Um, and the reason was because they had, the funding that they had to support me was stopped because I'd been with them for three and a half years and they told me that was the only option that I had to take but then it turns out that it wasn't the only option I had. I could have waited until I got a house that I could similar call home. Um, I don't see homes as homes right now. 
because um, it's not mine. So I'm not c in control of it. Um, I, I really, like, <laughs> I kind of stress my artigies how, how strong I feel about children and young people getting into education and training. Nothing should stop them from doing that, and I think we really need to, really need to think about that because we're going to have kids that are just going to go down the wrong paths in life, and it's because no one wants to help them into training and education. Um, I'm just going to come in and then John Finney wants to come in. <clears throat> Listening to what you've all been saying, do you think if there was something like an adult foster carer that could take you into your, their homes till you were ready to leave, or be appointed to you as a fosterer while you're going through that transition from maybe moving from your home uh, support into sort of your own house and stay with you to actually feel you don't need them again. Do you think that would help you? I don't think, I don't think that's where the problem is. I think the problem is when people are actually being forced out of their accommodation, whether it's like <coughs> homelessness, whether it's your foster carers or supported carers. It's the fact that young people are being forced out of their own accommodation. I was forced out of my last accommodation because of money. Someone like a sort of foster supporter person that was there. I, when I think it would them. work, mm -hmm. um, but there also needs to be other support networks that yeah. alongside that. Okay, Connor, and then sorry, John Finney. Um, I just want to say that there is actually already supported carers in place, and they are essentially. So that's where I'm currently living just now is with a supported carer, um, and what they do is usually from about the leaving age of um, a children's unit, about the average of about 16, 17, um, they come in and there will be, not all young people get the opportunity, unfortunately, to access it, but you then do go and move to their house. And I've been with my current support carer for three years. Um, however, what I would say is that I don't actually think, although there are support carers out there, I don't actually think it's working in the way it's supposed to, because I think a lot of the time, when you leave a children's unit, you still don't know any of the skills. So you move into someone's house and they're supposed to teach you the skills, but then they're not being given the opportunity to do so because local authorities, when you move into that supported accommodation, seem to be in too much of a hurry to then get you out of that accommodation and into your own accommodation again, um, before you've probably been given the opportunity to have someone there. Um, and I think there are aspects of it that are good. I think the fact that they can act as a go-between so that the transition's not as, maybe not as rough as it would be if you just went straight in. Um, I think not a lot of people are made aware of the fact um, that there is, that does exist. Um, and what I would say, not a lot of people get the opportunity to use it either. It's very rare, there's not a lot of supported carers. And because of that, only select people um, will get the opportunity. And in my view, I think all Young people should be given that opportunity and I don't think they should be rushed out of that opportunity either because that is setting each and every young person that you rush out, that is setting them up to fail in life and that is not what we should be encouraging young people to do. Thank you very much for that, Connor. John? Great, thank you, Convener. Uh, there's a lot of very positive terms are used in these conversations and one of them is housing support duty. I, I, I wonder if some of the young people could comment on that and did tell us whether they've had a, a housing support assessment at any time. I know you're all very personal experiences, but if you're aware of these terms, and indeed if that term means anything to the, the agencies, you know, um, because it seems to me that the word support Doesn't. should play a pivotal mm -hmm. role in all of this. No? Paul? I think support is, is the pivotal feature. I think, you know, listening to Charlene and Connor um, reflects my own experience, I think, um, which is that what we need to be developing here, I think, is uh, relationships. It's not really about buildings. It's about developing relationships. It's about making sure that young people have got um, others in their life that they can look up to, that they can benefit from, that they can take guidance and advice from. And uh, the idea of a mentor, I think, might be a useful one rather than supported carers or uh, foster homes for, for adults. I think mentoring individuals 
um, and, and having that personal relationship that they can go to when they've got a, a difficulty that they don't understand or an issue that they find uh, troublesome to deal with, they can get that, that advice and a largely informal basis might be helpful. Claudia? Uh, just a sort of our advocacy experience, young people upon leaving care tend to engage with us in relation to, to housing related issues um, when they are having decisions made to them in relation to their housing uh, support etc. One of the things, uh, just to pick up on Paul's point about mentoring, one of the things um, with regard, I think it's a great idea and we actually actively pursue that amongst the, the, the young people's net networks that we have. However, if you take the comparison of uh, yourself and if we were um, having to experience a, a situation, a legal situation where we were maybe being threatened with eviction or threatened uh, with bankruptcy or something along those lines, we would expect to engage with a lawyer and a legal representative and a professional representative to help us negotiate and realise our rights. Unfortunately, we are seeing young care leavers not able to, to engage with those services, those professional dedicated services. And we believe that that's why there has to be safeguards in the system. I think there has to be a continuum um, of support from peer relationships, from relationships from care, um, friendships, and formal relationships to the to the sort of professional based relationships too, because that's the ultimate safeguard, and these young people absolutely deserve that. Um, and we find, as an advocacy of our organisation, we're using our professional independent advocates to realise rights um, in Scotland for these young people. Thank you. Um, Moving on, I don't know if Siobhan wants anything to ask. Is there anything you want to ask, Siobhan? I was just going to ask something about the um, following on from Christian Convener about obviously we've done a report and that's why we've asked people back um, into experiences and one of the things we spoke about in the last report was the community care grant and obviously that's changed now into the social fund um, and the Scottish welfare fund so we're just wondering from the organisations probably and not for the individuals because I don't know if you've had experience of trying to get um, a grant for, for tenancies um, the lead in is now up to eight weeks we're told has that made a difference is it too early to say it's made a difference or, or what more can we be doing, um, if, if anyone's got an opinion on that? Jordan. When I applied for my community care grant, when I first moved out of the supported accommodation at Seaforth House, I went into a house with literally nothing. There was light in the walls for a stay. A lot of work needed done. I applied for the community care grant, and I was knocked back twice before I had to get an intervention done through another uh, organisation that Why People works closely with before I was given an amount, and even then I was given a very low amount, considering how much was needed, how much was asked for, and then I had to seek support from my school and from local rotary, rotary clubs just to put carpets on my floors. There's something needs to be done about it. The fact that they're knocking people back. Matthew. Yeah, in Highland, um, I've only just found this out recently, um, we have access to, I believe it's Section 25 money. Um, I believe it's a discretionary fund that um, social work have access to, and they can provide grants up to £1,500 um, for young people moving on into their own tenancy. But the problem is that doesn't even come close to covering the cost. You know, as Jordan's just pointed out, you know, the cost for just carpets alone, you know, can run into six to eight hundred pounds. You know, just depending on, uh, you, you know, how big the property is. You know, that's not factoring in all the white goods you need, etc. You know, so it, you know that needs to change. Thank you, Just on a, a different subject, obviously, Claudia, you spoke about the, the Children and Young People's Act, and obviously uh, in your written paper as well, you spoke a, a lot about that, and others have. Um, I'm just wondering, obviously, there's changes next April um, to what happens with, with young people in residential foster or kinship care, and the age has gone up to 21, I understand now. So what difference do you think that would make, uh, and are there other differences that we, sh we should be looking out for, given that it is a new piece of legislation it will need time to embed, but but what should we be looking at as a as a committee? Okay, I think there's uh, I think there's a few things that as a, an equal opportunities committee, um, you know, there's a lot of encouragement to take from the the, the legislative provisions um, enacted uh, from April next year. With regards to looked after children and with regards to uh, what's being referred to as the continuing care provisions, um, that effectively means that a young person in kinship, foster or residential um, placement should be able to stay up until 21 if they feel they want to. And that should be a right which they should exercise. And as soon as it's exercised, it should be taken into account. And um, the, you know, the, the, the placement should effectively be available to that young person. 
I think, um, as with any piece of legislation, there's always the requirement to make sure that the intentions of it are completely followed through in practice. One of the, um, I guess, one of the worries that we have, but we are um, working alongside Scottish Government colleagues on, is to make sure that practice realises um, the best possible practice. Young people um, must be informed but, uh, from social workers, from other corporate parents in their lives that they have that entitlement. Um, obviously, one of the things that happens when a young person is in care around about 15 is, you know, beyond uh, the formal supervision order, life beyond that is starting to be thought about. Um, but at that point, and before that point, we must be talking to young people um, about the, you know, what being in care and that care placement for an extra two, three, four, and sometimes five years would, would make to them, the decisions they could make, um, the, the, the mistakes they could make and learn from, um, and pretty much allow them to kind of grow up um, a bit with a bit more support around them. We would hope that the uh, continuing care law is actively encouraged um, and that young people understand their right and their entitlement to request to stay put in that placement. Um, with regards to the expansion of corporate parenting, we believe it should be welcomed by this committee that there are now uh, 24 corporate parents in Scotland with the formal duty to give regard to um, uh, looked after children and young care leavers' well-being. We also um, think that this uh, committee would probably be encouraged by the fact that well-being has been put in legislation for the first time uh, ever. Uh, um, and you know, this obviously takes forward the Gurfe contention and puts it into, into the face of into the face of uh, legislation, which again we uh, we actively um, we actively welcome. The aftercare provisions have also been increased to 26, which again we are uh, very encouraged by. We believe that that um, extra entitlement of another five years beyond the and care going into independent living um, should be welcomed and should be encouraged by, again, all corporate parents uh, for young people to take advantage of. Obviously, there's pitfalls to, to any legislation realising their legislative intentions, and we must make sure that practitioners at all levels and all, all of the corporate parents understand the, the duties and the implications of the duties and how to apply them. Um, sometimes we find that young care leavers and people who are looked after unfortunately stumble at the first block with an organisation, and that sometimes can be a receptionist, someone on the phone, and they may feel that they're being judged because of their, their status. So we have to make sure that all, all levels of all CPs have a general working understanding of what a looked after child's life is like and also the implications of, of the new act. Um, but we are very encouraged by the, the intentions that could possibly be realised for, for Scotland's looked after children and care leavers. Yeah, I mean, that's very comprehensive. It goes back to what the convener said, though, earlier about how you get that message to young people, because, of course, Charlene's explained, you know, if you don't know where to turn to, yeah. then you can't get the information. So what can we do as a, as a committee in, in calling for? Obviously, you are working with the Scottish Government, which is great, but what should we be asking for? How do you think that message could get... So I think there's a few things. I think, first of all, it is a classic case of you don't know what you don't know, and you can't know it until you know it, and that sort of what we see time and time again uh, with the young people that we advocate on behalf of. Information has to be available as widely and as readily and as in, as in many uh, formats as possible. There also is duty to inform placed in the, uh, in the, uh, the Children and Young People Act, and that duty to inform must be evidenced. Um, you know, previously legislation was maybe, with regards to looked after children and young care leavers, was maybe not tight enough in placing that duty to inform um, on, o onto the statutory services. And we believe that duty to inform um, must be questioned, must be queried, and a young person must be able to challenge that if they feel they've not been informed. Um, with regards to, to, to information, we believe that all corporate parents, and that's teachers, you know, that's uh, nurses, it's doctors, it's GPs, it's effectively all the community anchors that we see around, uh, around our streets and around our environments. We believe that uh, there should be information promoting um, what the rights are to, 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 to young care leavers and to young people that are looked after in these communities. And we believe that's also vitally important for young people that are looked after at home and maybe and also in kinship care and young people that are maybe not around so many statutory services by virtue of their residential care status. Um, but again, sometimes uh, we believe that we, 
you know, we also have to take the advice from what young people say works in terms of receiving information, and that's been told things repetitively. It's been told things by a variety of people. It's been told things in a variety of formats, um, and it's been reminded as often as possible from the people that you trust about what rights you have. And again, that goes back to the point that we've all echoed the young people and the organisations alike around this table. Relationships matter to, to, to young people. Trust in relationships matter. Um, and if we empower these relationships to be um, to be available to young people and to stay with young people, I believe that that is the predominant way which young people know what's available to them and what rights they, that they have. Thank you very much. I think John Finney would like to come uh, in. Thank you, Convener. Convener, there's, there's one category of accommodation that hasn't been mentioned thus far, unless I, I've, I've didn't pick it up. If it has, I'm sorry if it, that's the case. And I, I'd like to ask about care leavers on temporary bed and breakfast accommodation. Um, I, I've posed a, a couple of parliamentary questions, and, and uh, there are very, very detailed responses there, covering every local authority. And they suggest that, and I quote, the number of young people who have been care leavers who are presenting as homeless has fallen by 40 per cent in five years. But nonetheless, one in five young carers who had presented as homeless spent time in B&B &B during their application period, temporary accommodations. So I wonder if any of our young people have experience of that and whether the organisations would agree with me that that being the case, then there is a requirement to have a national minimum standards of quality of temporary accommodation for care leavers and as, um, enshrined in statute. Would any of the young people like to answer, or will we move on to the organisations? Jill? With regards to, to bed and breakfast, I feel that uh, you know, for the, the young people that come through our project, um, well, for a start, really, well, they've not got any support when they're in bed and breakfast, so they're in there, they're on their own, uh, you know, and, and, and that's not good. That's not good. So, yeah, we do need more uh, places made available uh, rather than a uh, bed and breakfast being an option, without a doubt. Darlene? Um, I don't think a young person that's experienced um, being in care should be in a B&B or a hostel. Um, just on the back end of what Julie's saying. Um, is that your name? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um they don't get support, and it's if I'm a 16 year old going into a B&B, you have got a variety of ages of men and older women, um, and a lot of the time there's a lot of peer pressure that could be different ages, and I just don't think that's the right environment for a young care leaver to be in that environment, to be surrounded by people. Um, and I think just on the other hand that I want to touch on, I, I don't think it's right that um, male and female should be sharing. Um, but that might be just something personal to me. But um, I just don't think it's approachable. I don't think it's right. Thank you. Um, John, are you OK? Can I bring John Mason in now? Well, perhaps Paul yeah, wants okay, to sorry, comment Paul. on the issue at all. Yeah. About temporary emergency accommodation, um, I'm a little sceptical of the figures that you've quoted, um, I have to say. Uh, my experience is that temporary emergency accommodation is used uh, very frequently for formerly looked after young people as their accommodation. It's also allocated to other young people who don't have a history in the care system um, as their accommodation. I think uh, Charlene has accurately identified the fact that young people going into that type of accommodation um, are often exploited. They do often very quickly encounter the world of drink and drugs and get involved in that, and that leads to obvious problems. Uh, in my view, temporary emergency accommodation for young people is always inappropriate. It should never be used for that, and I absolutely agree that there should be guidance and standards imposed to stop it being used in, a, in an ad hoc way. Can I, I take John Mason in, and then we need to start winding up? Yeah, just um, on the point of being unintentionally homeless, I mean, I've certainly had a case in my constituency where the suggestion was it was very difficult to persuade the council that somebody was unintentionally homeless. And if somebody had been sofa surfing 
the council wanted to know all the details of all the places they'd been at, which was difficult for the person because some of the people they'd been staying with didn't want that disclosed. And I just wonder if that was an issue, or if it's an issue in particular areas, perhaps like Glasgow, or if, it, if it's an issue that people have come across. Charlene. Um, I'll give you a quick example. Um, when I got my first ever tenancy, um, it was through a supported accommodation, so it was outreach. Um, I went through various problems and issues with my neighbour up the stair. Um, putting things through my door, lighting things, putting it through my door. Went to my housing association five times. <coughs> um, didn't get anywhere with them. Um, tried to get some support by my supported workers. Um, who refused blank to help me because the young person up the stair was also supported by the accommodation. Um, so therefore, when I went to my housing association and I told them that I was leaving because my, I didn't feel safe, um, I felt as if my life was threatened because it's, who, who in the right mind should be living in that environment with people like that? Um, there was no, no support there. And the first word, word that came out the housing officer's mouth was, you're making yourself intentionally homeless. There is always a reason for young people leaving their flats, and that's where people need to go to. That's where the housing officers need to sit down and chat to them about it. They're not making themselves intentionally homeless, and I think that word should be just gone, because it's no right. It's no right to be using it. We should just say homeless, and that, that should be full yeah. stop, yes. Yeah, yes. but because there's always a reason why yes. Yes. why young people end up on the streets or end up back into that circle of going round hostels and supported accommodations, and I think that's the reasons that they need to get to. They don't need to just go, well, you're just making yourself intentional homeless, give your keys, see you later. Um, if they give the young people the time of day and actually look into the inquiries of why that young person doesn't feel safe in their own home when they should actually feel safe in their own home, um, I, I just... That's great. Yeah. Paul, can very briefly? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think uh, intentionality is an important issue. Um, there's a, a fair bit of subjectivity around the criteria that are applied to decide when intentionality applies. Um, some local authorities now are limiting the offers of uh, social housing to prospective tenants. And... Um, where an individual refuses to take a tenancy in an area that they find unsuitable or because there are relationships that they wish to avoid in that particular area, all too often we're hearing that uh, uh, they have to take it, otherwise they'll be found to be intentionally homeless. They won't get any more offers. And I think Charlene, uh, again, accurately identifies the fact that um, some individuals living in uh, unsuitable accommodation that really need to move on and they make that decision that they have to move on for their own well-being are being considered intentionally homeless as well. And I think that's inappropriate also. Thank you very much. Before I actually conclude today's meeting, can I actually say thank you to every single young person that actually came today. You actually have been an inspiration to us all and I'm really, really moved by what I've actually heard. So thank you very much. That actually include, include, uh, concludes today's meeting and our next meeting will take place on Thursday, 25th of September. Thank you. <laughs>